Well, good afternoon, everyone. I will now turn it over to our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Fa Janice Fitzgerald, for uh, today's update. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Since the media availability yesterday, we have no new positive cases in the province. The total number of cases in our province remains at 261. <clears throat> By region, we have 243 cases in Eastern Health, eight in Central Health, four in Western Health, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health. 52% of cases are female and 48% male. And by age, we have 22 people under the age of 20, 38 people between 20 and 39, 39 between 40 and 49, 58 between 50 and 59, 57 between 60 and 69, and 47 who are 70 and above. Four people are in hospital due to the virus, and of those, two are in intensive care. 244 people have now recovered, and in total we have tested 9,592 people. Our combined efforts have effectively contained the spread of COVID-19 in our province, and we have done exceptionally well in flattening its curve so far. There is no small this is no small victory and is directly attributable to the unwavering fortitude and commitment of each of us. I cannot thank you enough for your continued efforts, patience, and cooperation. If all goes well this weekend and the number of new cases remains low, on Monday we will be moving to alert level four. This is a considerable milestone as we must move to this next phase of living with COVID-19. We must continue to follow the evidence-based prevention practices that have served us so well so far. To be successful in this transition will require us to stay at home as much as possible, especially when we feel unwell, to practice proper cough and sneeze etiquette, to wash our hands often and well, and maintain safe physical distance from others when in public spaces. I cannot overstate the importance of these measures as we move through the alert levels according to our plan. While moving to alert level four is the first phase in our transition process, this does not mean that we are in the clear to do whatever we please. Rather, it means if we tread slowly and carefully, we will again regain some of the freedoms we have lost due to COVID-19. Specifically, Alert Level 4 permits the gradual resumption of some activities and business operations while maintaining certain public health orders to help mitigate risk. This includes gatherings for funerals, burials, and weddings are expanded to no more than 10 people as long as physical distancing can be maintained, but visitation and wakes uh, remain prohibited. Recre recreational angling and hunting are permitted. Golf courses can open with restrictions in place and municipal parks can reopen, uh, but playground equipment should remain closed. Campsites, gyms and f fitness facilities, uh, yoga studios, sports arenas and facilities, dance studios and performance spaces will remain closed. Regional health authorities will begin allowing some healthcare services to resume, the private health care clinics remain closed except for urgent and emergent care and with virtual care options available for non-urgent care. All visitor restrictions in health care remain in place, as do the orders for long-term care, personal care homes, and assisted living facilities. Regulated child care centers will reopen with limitations and restrictions in place. Professional services, such as accounting firms, law firms, financial services, may offer in-person services, but work-from-home policies should be encouraged if possible. In-person worker and workplace safety training, such as standard first aid, are permitted, provided physical distancing measures can be maintained. <clears throat> Animal daycare centers can reopen. Garden centers can reopen for in-person sales and service, and landscaping and lawn care services can operate, again, providing physical distancing measures are in place. Retail stores that do not offer essential services, including bars and lounges, cinemas, and personal service establishments remain closed, as does in-person uh, dining in restaurants. <clears throat> for more information related to our COVID-19 alert system, including a detailed summary of public health guidance for all alert levels, please visit gov.nl.ca slash COVID-19. I'd like to mention today that we've received several inquiries seeking guidance and permissions related to pet grooming. And while the science on disease transmission in animals is still evolving, 
public health officials are looking at if and how this service can be safely provided, and we will advise accordingly when that's been determined. This pandemic has created disruption and uncertainty in our lives and has understandably at times led to increased stress and anxiety for most of us. COVID-19 has forced us to stay apart from our loved ones, friends, neighbours, and has heightened feelings of isolation and loneliness. But please know these feelings are normal and are shared by many. Technology has allowed us to find innovative ways to stay socially connected, but sometimes just picking up the phone to say hello is all that someone needs to raise their spirits and show them that people care. I've heard stories recently of people painting rocks with inspiring messages and leaving them on their neighbors' doorsteps. This is just another example of the ingenuity and thoughtfulness people have shown during this difficult time, and these simple acts of kindness never go unnoticed. If you or someone you know is finding it difficult to cope, there are a number of services readily available to support you and your loved ones. The Provincial Warm Line is available seven days a week from 9 a.m. to midnight. Please call 1-855-753-2560 to speak with a trained peer support worker who is there and ready to listen. The Provincial Mental Health Crisis Line, staffed by mental health clinicians, is available 24-7 by calling 1-888-737-4660. This service is available to anyone who needs it. You can also connect 24-7 with a crisis responder by texting WELLNESS, W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S, -S, to 741741. This service is provided by Kids Health Phone, but is available to anyone, regardless of age. Please know there is no shame in feeling anxious or worried, and reaching out for help is not a sign of weakness, but of strength and hope. During this unprecedented time, we need more than ever to be able to lean on others for support and compassion and to lift each other up when needed. Let us remember that there are bright spots in every day, even if some days have to look, we have to look a little harder to find them. As a recap for those who may have just joined, we have no new cases since yesterday's media availability and the total number of cases in the province remains at 261 with 243 cases in Eastern, eight in Central, four in Western, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health. As we prepare to turn the corner and enter alert level four, I would like to say once again how proud of how far we have come in this pandemic together. The spirit and tenacity of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians never ceases to amaze me, and I truly believe if we looked far and wide, we would never find a more devoted and resilient group of people. When times are tough, we always support each other. In closing today, I'd like to take this opportunity to wish moms everywhere a very special Mother's Day, filled with love, peace, and appreciation for all that you do in your children and families. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. Uh, you've noticed, I guess, there's just two of us at the table today that uh, Minister Hagee will be joining us virtually today. No, no. No positive cases today, it's really good news and welcome news for all Newfoundlanders and, and Labradorians. This is the result, as Dr. Fitzgerald has already said, of the careful decisions and your commitment to our public health guidelines. It is by your actions that we will continue to see days like today with no positive cases to report. Following guidelines is not a sign of weakness. It's in fact, it's a sign of wisdom, it's a sign of understanding. So together let's continue to be wise and protect our families. Do not let these results today change your actions. I cannot stress enough, as Dr. Fitzgerald has been saying, this does not mean that the virus isn't moving around us. It does not mean that you are safe or can bend the, the rules or look for loopholes. The virus may not be visible but it lives and moves silently amongst us. So these results today should motivate you. And we thank you for your efforts so far and ask that you continue to keep up the good work. Now prior to my political life, this would have been a very busy and a very important weekend. Important because Sunday is Mother's Day, a day that we set aside for a special tribute to all our mothers, our caregivers, and our protectors. This year during COVID-19, it's even more important that we recognize our mothers and all that they are doing for us. 
The majority of our essential workers are women, and many of them are mothers. They go to work every day, they help us, and then they go home to support their families. Now, some others are working from home, and they're balancing child care and homeschooling. Some are dealing with reduced family incomes as they adjust to temporary job losses caused by this virus. And the list can go on and on. What we do know is that all of these women have commonalities. They are intelligent, they're creative, they're resilient, they're brave, and they deserve our love and our respect on Mother's Day and every day of the year. Although these are challenging times, we have to think of the positives. It's times like this that allows us to connect in a very different way. Telling someone that you care, having a conversation, giving a virtual hug, expressing your appreciation through a phone call, or sometimes the most important, powerful gesture can be just saying thank you. Now, I'm going to take this moment to express thanks to my own mother. But she's been a great mother, great mentor for me, but she's also a fantastic grandmother and a fantastic great-grandmother. So I hope you have a wonderful Mother's Day, and I look forward to speaking with you over the weekend. But I also want to recognize that there another, there's another incredible woman who's been sitting to my left, and that's Dr. Fitzgerald. She's been providing the leadership during this public health state of emergency throughout this pandemic. She is one of the strongest individuals that I've come to know. And over the past few months, her life has been consumed with COVID-19. So it's in times like this that it takes her away from her family. So on behalf of all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, I want to say thank you to Dr. Fitzgerald and to wish her a very happy and a healthy Mother's Day. You know, honoring and supporting the women in our lives and in our communities should not just be reserved for this important day, but it should be carried through all the work that we do and all the efforts that we put into it. As we celebrate the mothers in our lives this weekend, it is important to recognize the work that women are doing throughout the province. We know that COVID-19 impacts women differently. It impacts them more deeply and more broadly. We remain committed to improving the safety and the economic security of women in our province. The status of the Office for the Status of Women has been monitoring the response for COVID-19 provincially and nationally, and has been advising the gender-based impacts on the, since the start of this crisis. And we will continue this work throughout the recovery process. So as we head into this weekend, we want to remind everyone that our daily updates will be provided through a news release. This is Friday, so on Saturday and Sunday, we will put out the releases through our daily updates. And on Monday, we will pick up our daily, our regular daily briefings. And that is when, as Dr. Fitzgerald has said, we have the potential to move into Alert 4. And that is our plan to living with COVID-19 in our province. Part of what you will hear on Monday, hopefully, are the changes to the provincial ferries. Now, a public advisory will be issued just shortly to list the changes that will come into effect. It will include information about ferry passengers who, who are no longer restricted to just essential travel, but we encourage you to travel infrequently. However, if you are traveling, you are encouraged to wear a non-medical mask or face <coughs> covering. And you are still required to, main, to remain in your vehicle and practice physical distancing. <coughs> we have to remember that public health state of emergency remains in effect and the health guidelines must be followed. For the most up-to-date, factual, trusted information, continue to visit our website at gov.nl.ca forward slash COVID-19. Now on Sunday, a reminder that Confederation Building will be lit in yellow to recognize the amazing work of our essential workers. This includes the frontline workers in our province, like the independent grocers. And I know some, I know times are a little different right now and people have been adjusting to a new way of shopping. It can be a little frustrating. So I ask you as customers to please have patience. 
Businesses and their employees are doing everything that they can to put your health and safety measures in place is for your benefit, but also for the benefit of their staff. So let's give them a smile. Let's give them a big thank you for the, for the work that they are doing. But also speaking of essential workers, I got on an email the other day about a young man from Buren. His name is Andrew Billard. He's currently seven years old and about to celebrate his big eighth birthday tomorrow. Now, Andrew is wise beyond his years. And at 7 p.m. every day, he plays his drums for essential workers. Now, when the weather cooperates, he does it from his patio. When it's not cooperating, he does it just inside his house with the door open. So, Andrew, we want to thank you for your commitment and your acknowledgement of our essential workers. No matter how you are celebrating your birthday this weekend, I hope you spend a good one with your parents, Ryan and Shana Billard. And make sure, everyone, if you get a chance to tune into FaceTime Live, where Andrew will have a video this weekend, and you can also send him a happy birthday. Now, it's wonderful to see so many good stories coming out of the challenging times that we're facing, and we are facing everywhere in our province and around the world. Some of these stories come from companies throughout our province that continue <coughs> to step up and they give back. Companies like Fortis, who just recently announced some $500,000 for nonprofit organizations who, are, who will be supporting the most vulnerable in our communities. This is another great example of what community is and what it means to work together towards a common goal. We're in a different time, there is no question. But it's how we decide to face the adversity that will have an impact on our well being. So as we head into this weekend, continue to follow the health guidelines. Check in with your loved ones. Remember the importance and the simplicity of just a simple phone call. So stay safe, everyone. And to all the moms and mothers across this great province, once again, happy Mother's Day. I will now turn it over to Minister Hagee. Thank you very uh, much, Premier. And again, no cases today is good news as we walk into the weekend that will hopefully enable us on Monday to, uh, to begin the uh, easing of some of our restrictions. Um, Premier has referenced uh, some events over the course of uh, this weekend and today, and I, I just add a couple to that, if I may, before I start with my main remark. Uh, the Jane Way has a fundraiser today, uh, Jamarama at Home, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, an occasion where in the past people would have gone to work and perhaps worn their, uh, their jammies, but uh, that's not happening today. So uh, I would encourage people to uh, take a, a snapshot, a hashtag Jamarama at home, and make a donation to the Janeway Foundation. Uh, it is also the beginning of Deaf Awareness Week, and I think it's another good opportunity to just recognize um, the, uh, the two ladies off to uh, stage left uh, that uh, do the interpretation and have done uh, for the last uh, over 60 days. Uh, and uh, thank you for Heather and Sheila. Um, we have mentioned around stress and the difficulties that uh, we encounter with dealing with COVID-19 and the unusual circumstances that we find ourselves in. On um, the Bridge the Gap uh, website, there is actually a button for those over the age of 18 called Check It Out NL. Uh, this has been there for some time, but it's essentially a self-assessment tool. Uh, you can walk through it in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and at the end of it, it to make some recommendations as to other apps or other places you may want to go uh, for, um, for support based on the answers to your questions. And I think it's been a hidden gem, uh, and I would recommend it to those who are feeling challenged at the moment. Um, over the course of the last few weeks, I've been asked a variety of questions about health care and public health in general. Uh, one of the issues that came up was around the grade six vaccinations uh, with Gardasil and the like. Um, those of grade six that would have had their first injection uh, will be covered um, from a uh, vaccination point of view until their second, which the intention is to defer that now until uh, the fall. Uh, assuming that schools will reopen uh, in some way for physical uh, classes, at which point those vaccinations would be taken up once again. Uh, if not, then we will work over the summer to try and figure out 
an alternate way of delivering these. We have excellent uh, child and youth vaccination rates in this province, some of the highest in the world, let alone in Canada. And it would be a shame if uh, if they slip. Um, the uh, uh, preamble from Dr. Fitzgerald mentioned in-person visiting restrictions in healthcare facilities, which will remain. Um, the RHAs now, though, however, will be resuming window visits. There was a pause last week because of safety concerns, particularly in Eastern Health, where someone had turned up with a ladder to try and visit a family member on an upper story of a long-term care facility. Uh, so uh, there is also now package drop-off <coughs> available for long-term care facilities. This should be done in consultation with a particular facility as they have some requirements for health and safety that will allow the contents of the package to be safely delivered to, to your loved one. I know some of the personal care homes are also uh, made arrangements uh, to, to do this. So again, bearing in mind the, uh, the nature of the weekend and the urge to give gifts as a way of connectedness, uh, these are uh, uh, safe uh, yet uh, limited ways in which we can introduce the, um, some degree of, uh, of contact and normality. One of the challenges over the coming weeks now as we look towards relieving some of the constraints around the lockdown uh, will be around what to do and in what order. And Dr. Fitzgerald has one of the most comprehensive plans that I've seen of any jurisdiction uh, in Canada. It's staged, it's slow. The, the easy bit really was to do the lockdown, was to introduce the state of emergency and put in place these orders what will happen now as we try and lift them in an evidence-based and science-informed way is that we're beginning to, to regulate uh, almost every aspect of daily life in a way that no one has done before and some people, quite rightly, are, are concerned over. I think people are seeking certainty where all we can provide is some degree of public health clarity. Uh, and I think the next week we'll see that increasingly becoming a subjective debate as, uh, you know, who gets what, in what order, and, and why. Uh, and I think people need to be aware that the decisions that we make are based on public health principles, guidance and instruction from public health, and that at the end of the day, businesses themselves need to filter that through their own particular lens, whether they are a, a sport or recreation facility, uh, a, a golf course, or whatever. Certainly, uh, public health are available to to, dis to discuss or comment on plans if, if guidance is needed. But it's really down to the businesses to provide that granular level of, of interpretation. Uh, and I'm sure at the end of the day, uh, a third of the people will like what we do, a third of the people will hate what we do, and the rest in the middle probably won't have a strong opinion one way or another. Um, so I, I would encourage people to think carefully about how they wish to proceed in the light of the guidelines that Dr. Fitzgerald puts out. One of the other topics that I dealt with actually in the media this morning to some extent is the issue of some uh, disquiet or concerns about out-of-province workers. Um, there have been people, we needed the ability in healthcare, for example, with some of our sophisticated equipment to have access rapidly to technicians uh, and uh, engineers uh, in the event of a malfunction. That we couldn't afford as a healthcare system going into a pandemic or even under the circumstances that we find ourselves now of being unable to uh, provide some of those critical care services for 14 days while people self-isolated. That was the intent around the, uh, the exemptions, and it was only an exemption for the period of time in the day that these individuals would be at work, and it was ideally suited for skills that weren't available in the province. Uh, there have been essential projects designated. We have healthcare infrastructure that's nearly finished that we need and will need should COVID come back, uh, and we expect it to. Um, we have left it up to the contractors to determine what within those projects are essential workers. But the bottom line is that anybody who comes into this province is required to self-isolate for 14 days. There is an exemption under certain specific circumstances only for those individuals with skills that are needed on a job site and only on a job site that can comply with the recommendations and instructions from Dr. Fitzgerald about, uh, about distancing. So I hope that provides some clarity, if not some certainty. So as we move into a holiday weekend, 
The bubbles have increased, but there is a temptation around Mother's Day to stretch your bubble a little bit. But be careful it doesn't pop, because that will come back to haunt us all. Um, uh, in terms of my own family, uh, I have uh, three mothers in the family who were once daughters, and they're scattered across the country uh, with their families, and I wish them a, a happy weekend, and we'll use this kind of technology to join in. It's also in Ganda, the graduation for Ganda Collegiate. Uh, they have uh, a really different graduation, and I'm sure a lot of schools have, um, have done this already. Um, the town has decorated its houses uh, with the school colors, uh, and um, the graduates have dressed up in their finery and had their, their snaps taken. Uh, and I hope that they have a good day and a safe, physically distant day. So again, we have our bubbles. We must protect them and look after them and we must not injure anybody else's. Because we've done this and we've done well, we need to continue to do this and get out of the other end of this so we can come to terms and live with COVID-19. So with that, Premier, I'll uh, conclude my remarks and hand the event back to yourself. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. And we now open it up for questions to the media for today. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, we have five reporters registered for today's call. Each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions and one follow-up. We suggest that you not ask rumor-based questions. The purpose of these briefings is to address COVID-19 issues. All other government-related issues should be directed to the appropriate department or agency for response. Reporters will ask questions in the order they registered for today's call. I will call each person by name to ask the question, so please do not press star 1 until your name has been called. Following this, should time permit, reporters will be individually asked for single questions. This call will end at 2.59 p.m., and further questions can be emailed. Our first questions today are from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Dr. Fitzgerald, uh, we saw you get a bit emotional there. You talked about Mother's Day. I'm wondering if you can give us an indication on, on how hard this has been for you and in being a mother while covering COVID-19 in the province. Oh, you don't want me to get that emotional again. <laughs> I certainly don't <laughs> want to, but it's been a... It's been a very challenging time for everybody. We have a lot of mothers on our staff, and uh, uh, I, I certainly would like to send out my best to all of them, and they have been all working tirelessly uh, for at least two months now. I know that for a lot of us, COVID has been in our lives since the middle of March, but for most of us on the public health team, COVID has been in our lives since Snowmageddon. So uh, we've been dealing with this for uh, about three months and uh, it's been it's been challenging and people have sacrificed a lot. So. so Kellyanne, I know people, you know, when you look at and you see the emotions that get expressed at this table from time to time, but what I can say as Premier of the Province is that we have a lot of great mothers and women that work in uh, the public sector in, in, uh, for the government of Newfoundland and Labrador. And I can tell you that our, our group at the public health, our group in public health is just doing a remarkable job. There's a lot of work goes on behind the scenes, a lot of long hours, a lot of dedication, and people that are extremely committed to the work that they do. They just do not want to let it go. Uh, they clearly have the health of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians first and foremost. And unfortunately, from time to time, they've taken them away from uh, many hours with their family. And I think all of us will, uh, as Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, will take this Friday leading into Mother's Day to wish them all a uh, happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Um, shifting a bit back to COVID here, I'm sorry, but uh, looking for some clarification on the Horizon site outbreak in Alberta. Uh, we've had a few companies reach out now saying that they aren't aware of an outbreak and that their companies up there are unaware of it. I'm wondering if we can get a bit more clarification on this. Yes, uh, so my apologies. It, it's really, we've had a couple of cases that have been identified from there, so we're just taking an abundance of caution uh, to ask people to check in because we want to make sure if there are uh, any connections that, uh, uh, you know, we that's an important thing for us to know in public health all all across the country, uh, if we're seeing connections to any camps or anything like that, it would be important uh, to know that. So uh, that's why we're asking people to uh, um, to identify themselves, to call 811, and to get tested. 
Thank you. And um, last month, we know amid COVID that the province's unemployment rate jumped to 16 percent. I'm wondering what the province is doing or planning to do to help with job recovery. With our province, we're working very closely with the federal government. We have a uh, we're doing a community engagement with our business leaders now in uh, across you know Newfoundland and Labrador. So there's a, an extensive reach out through a number of departments right now as we gather information so that we can make a strategic provincial investment, whether it be in financially or with regulatory changes that can actually simplify and get those businesses back in a very strong position. We're seeing some nearly 29,000 people now that have been, been out of work. And, you know, nationally, it's, uh, you know, the numbers are very similar in terms of, of um, uh, percentages. So we work very closely with those business groups, making sure, because we know that they were the job, they are the job creators for people in our province. And we want to make sure as we get through the health situation that we come through this very strong and we will be there to support our businesses. Thank you. Our next questions are from Tyler Dunn of VOCM News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hagee, you spoke about the necessity for out-of-province workers for the construction of health care facilities as a reason for exempting them from self-isolation. But what about those in the core science building? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, each department was asked to provide a list of um, uh, projects through government, anyway, that it regarded as essential, uh, I would suggest you would be best addressing your question either to Memorial or Transportation and Works. I uh, only offered up to uh, Transportation and Works and the panel the health project uh, for which we had direct knowledge. So I'm not in re really in a position to answer that question, Tyler. Okay, thank you. Well, just another one for you, Dr. Hagee. Um, you spoke about window visits as well in the beginning uh, to long-term care homes. Are allowing these types of visits up to the facility's discretion? The long-term care issue is done through the regional health authorities, and we have maintained uh, through the department that this should be consistent across the province. So all regional health authority long-term care facilities, unless there's some particular safety issue, my understanding is we'll be allowing uh, these visits. Um, with personal care homes, however, those are privately run facilities, and the decision there is down to the operator and owner. I do know, for example, in my own district, personal care homes are allowing this. I can't speak for all of them. And that, again, would be a local issue between um, a family member and the, the facility in which uh, their mom or dad was. Okay, and thank you. And what's the process for dealing with people who fly into the province and then are denied entry? My understanding is that they would be uh, returned uh, by the route that they arrived. And if there was a necessity, for example, for them to overnight to do that, uh, that would be arranged. I'm drawing on analogy here. That's what happened in the two cases that New Brunswick had. Okay, thank you. Our next questions are from Marie Isabel Rochon of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. clarification so um wondering is there a precise time on monday where the government we're going to switch from level five to level four of alert uh will there will it be during the press conference of monday or will the government issue a statement on sunday to tell uh people uh and some business that that they can uh enter at, at work uh, on monday morning uh, yeah, so the intention is that it would start with the start of uh, Monday, so at 12.00, well, or one minute after midnight, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So we'll send out a release, you know, through once we get the, uh, the green light from the uh, officials at Public Health and give a notification, I guess, sometime late on Sunday, uh, where we will be on Monday, as, as we say, at 12.01 for alert level four. I encourage Perfect. people to uh, visit the website too. There's some information there on what Alert Level Four means. So you know, get get yourself accustomed to and used to what Alert Level Four means to you individually and, and to your uh, if you want if you're a business owner. Thank you. And uh, with no tourists allowed in the province, and knowing that a lot of business rely on them uh, to make a living. Will the government encourage uh, Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to 
support local economy. So is there uh, is the government thinking of putting in place some kind of advertisement or some kind of initiative or a platform, online platform to encourage uh, yeah. to support local economy? So much of the movement around the province will depend on the success that we would see with the spread of the virus within our communities. So right now as we enter in, into alert level four and then take the 20-day assessment you know, through that process, given this is two incubation periods, that's the reason why it's 28 days of the virus. So there will be continuing monitoring by public health and we'll take the direction uh, from them um, and do the risk assessment on what it would mean as, we, as people continue to move, our prov or move around the province. So, you know, this is really the first step in relaxing many of the measures, but, you know, we can get to a point where it's comfortable and safely to move around our province and we could see, you know, facilities open up. Of course, we will encourage Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to, you know, visit parts of this province that they've not seen before, but this largely depends on the success that we have within our public health measures. I mean, ideally here, we want to keep the this, this spread and stop the spread of this virus within Newfoundland and Labrador. It is why we are tightening up our borders, but then and before we can comfortably do that, we must know that we can actually safely do that with the public health measures that we put in place. Yeah, but again, some problems, like again, for example, in Quebec, uh, they put it in place after two weeks, uh, an online platform to support local business by region. You're not thinking about doing something like that? We, uh, right now, what we're thinking about and working with, we know that the tourism industry industry in Newfoundland and Labrador will be one of those that will hit the hardest uh, based on the impacts of this virus within our province. And we're going to be working very closely with that industry. We're working with them already. There's a, a level of engagement that will require, you know, some support from the provincial government, some support from the federal government. And, of course, you know, maybe even regulatory changes, you know, could be something that we would need to look at what we want to do this summer is to make sure that they get through this particular summer as as, uh, as strong as they can be and they will be there to support the coming years but right now the big focus is on public health but we want to work with the business community as well as i said earlier they're the job creators and newfoundland and labrador will be in the future a very attractive place to live so it's important that we have that infrastructure in place so when we can do so safely that we'll have those, we'll have the accommodations waiting for visitors to come to our province, and we will welcome them back. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Premier, when you look at those job numbers, 29,000 people lost their jobs in the province over the last month. What would you say to those individual workers who are now struggling, not just with their finances, uh, but with the uncertainty of not knowing if or when their jobs will come back. Yeah. So we'll continue to work with the uh, federal government. We had a, another long call last night with the Prime Minister and, and other Premiers. We know that there are measures that we put in place, that some of which will be uh, cost-shared and some will be federally funded and, and, and some will, be, will have to be provincially funded. So the support will be there for individuals. We recognize that these are very challenging times for families within our province and some 29,000, Peter, that you've just mentioned. This is a big increase for Newfoundlanders and Labradorans. We, we saw the rates go from in March of 2020 to just under 12%. Uh, today, it's around 16% in unemployment numbers. Uh, in Canada, we're seeing the rates go to 13%. These are unprecedented numbers uh, for Canada nationally as a whole. So these are big numbers, and we recognize that all of us, both federally and provincially, will continue to work together to support those that are, that are unemployed and impacted uh, by this virus within our communities. When you look at liquor stores, they've done curbside pickup. Libraries say they're waiting for the approval from government. I don't know whether or not it's political or public health uh, to be able to do the same for books. We don't see libraries as part of the reopening plan. Uh, what's the latest on when they're going to be able to offer at least some service? Well, I think with whichever business it will be, there will have to be a risk assessment that will be done on how they would impact by the public health measures that we put in place. And there's a number of businesses, as the minister has said and as the chief medical officer has said so many times, you know, the easy part of actually, you know, pulling it back is one thing. That's a little easier. But as you start to open it up, you have to get a real good understanding and do the risk assessment of what's required. Uh, do we have the PPE available in case we get a an outbreak within? And do we have the 
uh, the health facilities that are ready to respond as an example. So these are just a couple things that we always must keep in the back of our minds as we open up the economy. Can we effectively respond to an outbreak? And we've seen other provinces now that have put dates in place and have had to pull back simply because we've seen the spread of the virus within within their provinces. So, you know, there is a recognition, you know, that this virus is still with us, and that is the reason why our plan is a little different, as, that the public health officials have put in place, given the alert system is very different than what you've seen in other provinces. And we think this will work. We think it will be effective. But it's important that we educate ourselves and make sure that we know what each alert level means, but we must be prepared uh, so that if we get an outbreak, we can effectively respond to it. Premier, with respect, though, that has nothing to do with libraries. They're not a business. They fall under the provincial government, and they're saying that they're waiting for approval from the province to be able to do this. Re so regardless, what's the hold up? Yeah, regardless what the service is, regardless of who owns it, it could be a community, it could be provincial government, the risk assessment on individuals and on the customers and those that would visit there, the risk assessment would have to be done. Thus, opening any particular business, uh, whether it's privately owned, government owned, or community owned, or if it's not for profit, we must understand what the impact that would have on public health and can they effectively provide that service on the public health measures that have, that have been put in place. As the chief medical officer just said a few minutes ago, as, we, as she talked about dog grooming, so we must look at that. If, if that service was to reopen, what's the impact? And you work with, uh, we work with uh, service providers exactly like that to see what the impact of, uh, would be on our communities. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. The, um, is, the, is the Department of Health aware of any increase in addiction counseling, especially with respect to alcohol, since the uh, pandemic measures came in place? Thank you very much, Peter. That's an excellent question. Um, the short answer is I don't have those statistics. We do know that we have had an increase, a significant increase uh, in some areas in terms of requests for mental health support, uh, either through things like Bridge the Gap, which has seen a 400% rise in, in, in hits to the website, or alternatively to um, uh, Warm Line and Channel and these kind of things. But specifically addictions, I don't know. I'll go and find out and see what we can get for you. Thank you. Uh and related to uh, the uh, stress levels and that sort of thing, uh, we've re received a few uh, examples of bubble trouble. I'm wondering whether the department has also received pleas from people such as grandparents who are experiencing a lot of anguish because they've been left out of the, the bubble bubble. Uh, certainly, Peter, from my point of view, I have received emails. I think uh, uh, it is a challenge. Uh, and, you know, I know of some families who have stayed in their own smaller bubble rather than uh, generate um, further worry and further agitation by the choice of who to expand it. As Dr. Fitzgerald has said before, yeah. just because you can expand your bu bubble doesn't mean to say that's necessarily the best thing for you to do. Um, so, you know, family dynamics is something we can't regulate, and nor would we try to do that. Uh, it is a difficult situation. We acknowledge that, uh, and yet we have to live with the public health realities that we have at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Dr. Fitzgerald, I just had one question. Uh, I mentioned tennis the other day. You mentioned dog grooming today. I know tennis and L, for example, they uh, sent a very detailed document outlining preventive measures, including uh, players not handling the same ball. Is there any flexibility over the span of level four for reconsidering one of these fan activities or are, they, are these decisions final? Um, so, you know, as we've said before, that this is a, a fluid uh, document and, and that things may change depending on the evidence that we get and the information that we get. Uh, public health can't know how every... Um, business or every activity can be run so uh, we're certainly open to discussion we're open to um, uh, reviewing evidence and um, you know making changes in recommendations as as need be um, there are some things that we will have to stand hard and fast on um, but uh, certainly we're open to um, reviewing information thank you 
you. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. We have time now for one more question per reporter, and we'll start with Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. I'm wondering if, uh, Seymour, you can speak to, or Dr. Fitzgerald, to some cabin rentals being allowed to open, but campsites not, hearing a lot from both sides saying that obviously both would like to open, wondering why one's being allowed and not the other. Kellyanne, was that cabins you're saying? Yeah, sorry, some cabin rentals. Um, I know along the Northern Bay Sands, for example, there's one there that's now been permitted to open. Yeah, so some people, uh, and this has come up a few times at this table now, I know some of the cabins you know, that people have for rent has been used for a lot of people that decide to self-isolate in those particular areas or self, you know, self-contained and so on. And so they've been, uh, they've been open. And I know uh, of a few, as you just mentioned, the campgrounds are uh, a different situation as a chief medical officer, as you know, spoke quite a few times this week. And some of it has got to do with how you share services. Some has got to do with, you know, the, the activities that could potentially occur, you know, at campgrounds. But we recognize that, you know, camping is extremely important for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. It's a way also to unite families. But, you know, at underlining and underpinning every decision that the chief medical officer and her team has been making is safety, is the public health safety of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. And as, you know, she just mentioned, there's an, an ongoing dialogue that will occur. Risk assessments must, must happen. And, you know, at the end of the day, someone has to make a decision here. Can you do this without... Uh, and do it safely. So, you know, ultimately here we're trying to slow the spread of this virus and some activities, you know, can actually make the argument that it can be done safely, staying in a cabin as an example, but in some others, you know, just simply can't. And so once the evidence is there that it can be, that can be done in a safe way, well, I guess, you know, her team will do the assessment on that and make a decision. Thank you. Our next question is from Tyler Dunn of VOCM News. Please go ahead. Thank you. At what alert level can post-secondary institutions return to a limited in-class instruction with social distancing? So that uh, that's a good question and uh, one that we're all still debating. Um, you know, post-secondary institutions are quite variable. You can have uh, some that have very small classes and some that have very large classes. So you have to consider uh, the number of people that are going to be in a, in a classroom together in close proximity with each other. Uh, so, and as the evidence evolves, as the epidemiology in our country changes and, and in our province changes, you know, that will um, inform uh, those types of decisions. For right now, certainly we recommend that uh, any learning uh, through post-secondary that has to happen be uh, online or as much as or virtual as much as possible, uh, recognizing of course that some programs will need to have some hands on um, um, hands on teaching um, and uh, those situations are being uh, assessed and uh, to see how they can be done safely um, and uh, you know with the principles of physical distancing and things like that in mind. So I know, you. Uh, you know, I know some of our post-secondary education educators are actually making plans and provision already for what the <coughs> fall uh, semester would look like, and this is important now as we use this time, as as Dr. Fitzgerald has just said, to actually plan for the different scenarios that might come up. And so it's uh, you know still early days into this, but it's important that we start as quickly as possible, keeping in mind that some courses would require labs, some more can effectively be done, you know, from a distance point of view. So I will uh, take this moment to you know thank all. All the uh, you know the staff at Memorial University, the professors, and so on, and include the students. I will say as well, as as with the college system as well, and some private you know institutions within our province that have done a really good job and it's responded swiftly to make sure they were able to continue to support the students. Uh, on really, which was really in some cases within a week, uh, the transition had been made, and they did a very good job with short notice. Our next question is from Marie Isabel Rochon of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Yes, wondering how many people are currently uh, self-isolating uh, uh, be because of contact tracing and how many of those people are health care workers? From a health... Uh, Healthcare perspective, the those that are self-isolating right now, we have the numbers right here with us. There's a total of uh, uh, 210 and 16 of them has been tested positive. Those that have been contacted through uh, uh, 
uh, contact tracing, I would not have those numbers. I don't know if the minister would have access to those or not. No, we haven't kept a tally of those who voluntarily self-isolate because we had no, uh, no means of doing that from the beginning. Um, the previous figures are accurate. The only comment I'd make about the staff who tested positive is that data is from the beginning of the, uh, the uh, first wave, uh, and we have not had a member of staff in healthcare facility test positive now for at least five weeks. Okay, and you just, just don't have another. Yeah, you only have one. Question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You only have one question. Our next question is from Peter Callan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Hi, Peter. Uh, this is a question for Minister Hagee. Uh, in other parts of the country, staff in hospital are wearing masks and face shields when dealing with all patients. So even if we have a situation like we had last weekend, where someone ends up testing positive, uh, then no one ends up having to be isolated. Uh, because they were wearing the proper precautions. So why aren't we doing that here? My understanding, Peter, is that there are masks being provided per shift. We had some discussions in which I was involved with the, uh, the unions. Now, whether or not that has actually been changed or, or not, I will find out for you. But my understanding was that there had been a debate about how many masks should be issued to frontline healthcare workers to tide them over a shift. Uh, rather than whether or not they were going to get them. Uh, there's a lot about that um, uh, incident last weekend that is still with Eastern Health, and I am waiting some detailed reports uh, about that. So as soon as I have some more clarity around that, I'll be happy to share it. Our final question today is from Peter Jackson of The Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, still getting a lot of... Uh, uh, anxiousness from daycares. Uh, they run out of uh, bridge funding, as, uh, from what I understand, at the end of May. Can you explain, again, how a person, for example, uh, providing daycare at home for four or five other children along with their own children? I mean, how are they supposed to stay in their bubble? Are you talking about the, you're not talking about regulated daycares now, are you, Peter? Because the regulated... No, uh, yeah. this would apply mostly to someone who's providing it at home. Yeah, so those that are providing it at home right now, if it's a... Uh, if you're an essential worker, you get up to $200 a week uh, for those that can provide their own, you know, through their own mechanisms. And in a lot of cases, that is with family and friends or those within their neighborhood that they would, uh, they would know and they can trust to, uh, you know, put their children there. So we're paying those now some $200 a week for those essential workers uh, who've used those, you know, family daycare centers, as you just mentioned. So that has been provided now and has been for quite a number of weeks. Thank you very much. The time for questions has ended, and I too would like to extend a happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers in the province, especially my mom. Please join us again on Monday at 2 p.m., 1.30 in most of Labrador. Have a great weekend, everyone.